One, two, chuffy, chuffy, one, two. I'll do this quite early. And we've got says, hey, you. And you got to, that attracts your attention, look. That attracts your attention. One, two, chuffy, chuffy, one, two. This is the sound check. It says, hey, you. I can flash the hey, you on and off. That's about long enough now. That's about long enough, really. Because you thumb over it on the, the thumbnail on your phone. And it, it does that. And it shows you the first few seconds. And you're like, oh, what's this? What's this? This is interesting. If you're here now, I've done my work. I've done my job. Good. You're watching. It's the best I can do for that. And what we're doing today... What we're doing today, well, you are listening to some relaxing video game music. There you go, there's Mario, he's relaxing, relaxing video game music. It better stay quietly in the background. I will check our, some relaxing video game music sound. Yeah, you can hear all that, that's all good in the hood. And what we're doing today is we're doing Tartaria again. <laughs> again, more of this stuff, more of this stuff. Poking into historical fires between 1840 and 1850. I found another. I found a new Tartarian. I found another one. There's loads of them. There's loads of them, it turns out. I found another one, Web of a Browser. Let's have a look at the Web of a Browsing that we're going to be doing. This is the YouTube video produced by Michelle Gibson. Michelle Gibson here. She's got loads of YouTube videos. She's got 50,000 subscribers, so I'm punching up again. Punching up in terms of subscriber numbers, maybe not in terms of critical thinking. Look, so anyway, she's got loads of subscribers and... Why does it say videos? Uh, uploads. Oh, she's got it organised slightly differently. Okay, uploads. She's got loads of videos as well, look. Oh, look at them all. Oh my God. Oh no, there's loads of them. There's loads of them. When I say loads, I mean absolutely loads. Absolutely loads. And there's loads of this Tartaria stuff and all sorts of weird stuff. Star forts, Master Mason canals. She thinks there was a planetary... One of the things she thinks... I've only watched a little bit of hers. One of the things she suggests is that they, there was, we had free energy before the Industrial Revolution. And so we had to shut that down pretty quick because we couldn't have everyone having free energy. So um, this particular video is called Poking... In this video, I'm... All right, Michelle. This is called Poking into Historical Fires, Part 2. The years between 1840 and 1850. I just picked a randomer. I just picked a random one. This looked interesting. So for today's episode, we're on YouTube. We're rolling. We're streaming. We're live on YouTube. Let me just pop out the chat because you need to have that pop down don't you you need to have your chat popped so that i can see it in case people start popping off in chat pop out chat there i got my own little window for that got my own little window for that and uh i should have it on the screen as well shouldn't i, I should have got this sorted before we started shouldn't i where's my chat window you chuffer where's my chat where is it actually? That's a bit weird. We have this sometimes, don't worry, I can't find the <laughs> Why can't I find it? Uh if I go big face. Chat window, got it there, look. <laughs> so I just copy that. Go on web paper browser and I just paste a new Oh no, it's there, it's there. Chat window. Yeah, got it. Okay. Oh, it's not. It's not done with the opacity. It's not been done with the opacity. So, let's give it an an opacity check. <laughs> Which one do I use? I can't remember. Just going to give it a bit of an opacity shift. There you go. Right, so now the chat is there, but you can't see it, but it is there. I'll do the little introduction on my big face. Do this one more time for the edit. What the hell? Why not? What for the hell? What the hell? One more time for the edit. One more time for the edit. Hi, you are with Scott. This is Grave Kipper. I'm Ganji Kid. It's Ganji Kid, my stream. I might change its name to Grave Kipper because Ganji Kid means... I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> this is the introduction. This is your right ear. This is your left ear. 
it's midnight it's always midnight but it's not it's 14 44 14 and 44 that's 2 44 in the uk p.m gmt i'm drinking horrible killer cola a few cans of that been left around the house so i might as well drink them but ooh. and we are listening to a youtube video by another no i should be careful what i say i won't call her a nutter I won't call her a, a straight nutter. I'm Ganji Kid. Subscribe to me. I need the subs. If you're watching this, hit me a like. And uh, calm and relaxing video music, video game music. And another nut. I'm not going to call her another nutter. You can make up your mind on that. You can make up your mind. We'll make up our minds together. What I do tend to do when I'm watching these videos is open up another window and use the Google to debunk the stuff they're saying. For this one, I want to try and get through the video. <laughs> when I start debunking, we go off on these like debunking sessions, and it just like you get two minutes of video and like forty minutes of debunk because they say so much random chuff in their weird videos in like thirty seconds that it takes you an hour to debunk it. But we're going to try and listen to a, a fair chunk of this and do fewer Google Google uh, fewer Google pipeline rabbit holes and just pick out a few points that we can debunk quite easily. Uh, some other things, they might take us down a rabbit hole. Who knows? Who knows? We'll just see where it goes, though, yeah? And I'll try and keep it flowing in terms of listening to their madness. Not madness. Suggestions, ideas, theories. In this video, I am going to examine the fires listed as having occurred in the years between 1840 and 1850. My name is Michelle Gibson. I believe that a new historical timeline grafted onto the existing physical infrastructure was officially kicked off by the exposition in London's Crystal Palace in 1851. Right, so I like the fact that Michelle's gone straight into it. I like the fact that her pictures are relevant and pertinent to what she's saying, and she's giving us real, like, factual... I say factual. Real information... Like, she's giving us information bullet points. She's not waffling. That's good. She's Michelle, Michelle Gibson. She thinks there's been some sort of tampering with history what confuses me though already is that she said that she thinks the new history was tacked on after the crystal palace uh london see i mean see what i do i'm straight into google i want to know the facts you see i don't want people just suggesting things on videos they haven't given us any evidence so they've just shown a picture and said something so i like to get some facts you see uh so crystal crystal Oh, that's a cozy that I'm using there, actually. I should probably just use the this one. Crystal Palace, uh, London. I'll just put Expo. I don't think they, did they call it an Expo back then? I don't think they did. Uh, exhibition. Exhibition, wasn't it? It was the... Because uh, I know a little bit about... Oh, we are in a cozy, so we planted a tree there. That's good. It was in the Victorian area. It was built for an exhibition. At this time, we had... Uh, a global empire. Queen Victoria was the head of the global British Empire. Um, oh, I don't care. I'm not coming back here. I'll just use the cookies, whatever. Uh, and we decided to have a big exhibition, the Great Exhibition. It was the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, a celebration of the modern industrial re revolution and design in not only Europe, but the rest of the world. So it was a big thing. Happened in 1851. Got all these records of about it, photographs and, you know, timeline. We know it happened. We've got all this thing. The Crystal Palace is still there in London. It still exists, the building. And uh, they built it all up. Had a big, big exhibition there. The great and the good were there. The normal people from around the world could visit, you know, the public. And uh, it really happened. We've got the historical records. We can carbon date the things. You know, we've got other methods of dating things because Crystal Palace was so recent that we can carbon date the items that were in there uh, so we know how old they are. Stuff like that. Um, that's a sketch there, but we, do have, we did have photography at the time. So if you want to find out all about the Crystal Palace, you can. I know a little bit about it off the top of my head. That's just a little bit of, you know, I don't know why it's been brought up now, but she suggests now, because we're supposed to be poking into historical fires, but Michelle has suggested that the... Crystal Palace exhibition marks the point. So, 1851. They think the Industrial Revolution was the bit that's... I don't know. They haven't given us a timeline here, so we know which bit was what and what's been taken out and where this has been put in. But that's a suggestion. After taking approximately 110 years to dig enough infrastructure out of a global mud flood to restart civilization, 
Right, the, this is a mistake. Like we talked about this in previous, because we've done a couple of these streams where we're debunking the Tartarians. There's this weird idea that there was a global mud flood that covered a pre-existing civilization. Now, what they're saying is that before the Industrial Revolution, there would have been a pre-existing civilization. It was covered in mud. We took a couple of hundred years to dig it out. We discovered all these like fine buildings and things, and then we were like, oh, we'll use them. They're handy. They're handy. But actually, what you could see here in this image is construction. Not digging out mud to reveal buildings. You can actually see the buildings are half built in this image. You can see the staircases and there's no walls. They're not going up high with the walls in the in the foreground because they've not been finished building them. The train tracks go to nothing in the foreground there. The train tracks go to nothing because they're not finished. And we know if you look at a building site in the modern world, like... <laughs> look at a building site you'll see where things are half constructed there's all mud everywhere just a random image here look there's all piles of mud around because they're digging in the mud and they're bringing in hardcore to, to build the things they're bringing in sand and cement and uh, we had this one yesterday we found this really good one which was buildings covered in mud if I put the sun then what you get is you get this image here uh, from a newspaper a recent newspaper All right, this is modern times definitely recorded no no messing about with the records here this was in the new oh it's the fake news media no it's not it's, it's in the news like because these people bought houses and they were cross because they hadn't finished the road outside. They did the building site like they normally do. They built the houses like they normally do. But they haven't finished the houses. Messy builders, look. Messy builders. They haven't finished the route, the road and the, the little bits of infrastructure around it. But they built the houses first because that's how we do it. That's how we do it. So the residents are cross. Oh, I'm cross. Can you finish my roads, please? Look at my roads. They're dirty. They're dirty roads. All mud everywhere. Because I haven't finished the build yet. Can you finish up? Clear up? Get gone? So when you're looking into this image, this is during the Industrial Revolution, I'm guessing. I mean, it's a black and white image. doesn't prove that it's old. But we can see in the background... Oh, I've got to be careful. I'll tell you what I've got to be careful of. Get gone. So when you're looking into this... Yeah, you can hear me all right. Tell me in chat, please, if ever it goes... Because sometimes I knock the wires because I've got all stuff all over the computer and table and all that. Sometimes I knock the wires and it goes... Tell me and I'll fix it. But I don't know because I'm not listening to myself talking my headphones. Just listening to the nice relaxing music. So look, we've got a nice image here of a building site, things under construction. I can't tell you exactly when it was photographed, nor has Michelle. Like, it's strange, they give us these funny ideas, these overviews of ideas in their videos, but they don't say, here is a photograph of definitely this, this is the record, this is when it was taken, these are the evidences. They just make suggestions and show you pictures, and you know you can Photoshop things and mess things about, so I don't know why we're supposed to take that as guaranteed evidence, but I'm assuming it is. You know, not a photoshopped image or a produced image. Artistically produced, even though it's just a collection of pixels on a screen. I'm assuming it is an old photograph then of a time when they're building all this stuff. And you can see buildings in the background. So you would be able to do your geo-guesser on this and verify where it is and when it was. And you'd be able to use those records of the buildings in the background. Because lo and behold, you know what? You know what we do? You guess what we do? Um, for example, say... Paul's Cathedral, right? St. Paul's Cathedral. This is just an example of a building, yeah? Just an example of a little building. Uh, let's show you in the images. St. Paul's Cathedral's in London. Look, it's in London. You might, these Tartarian people might say it's got this Tartar architecture, Tartarian architecture. They might think it's one of these old buildings that was mud flooded and uncovered. It has to be, doesn't it? Because it's of that architectural style and time. And if we want to go and find out about it on Wikipedia, we can see that it was built uh, 1710. There was a church on the site in AD 604. The present structure, dating from the late 17th century, was designed in the English Baroque style, not the Tartarian style, but English Baroque by Christopher Wren. So, Christopher Wren... Here, look, there's a painting of him. He existed. His actual plans and architectural designs for St. Paul's, they still exist. You can go and have a look at them. 
you can look at the very designs you can look at the pre-norman cathedral you know all this stuff is recorded all this stuff is recorded the church wrote it all down recorded it all you're into the church these tartarian people are they're into the church they like the church they're big on the church they think jesus is important well there's a jesus building there's one of the churches pre-norman goes back to all the way back and it's got history all the way through old saint paul's was built before this is a reconstructed before 1561 so it was there was fires in 1135 1240 an enlargement program in 1256 now it's constantly being worked on and updated and sometimes damaged and repaired so we've got all these records of it because the church recorded it all and when christopher wren big famous notable person when he redesigned it he obviously did blueprints and plans and they exist still we've got them in the museums and you can see all the different there it is all in you know okay you don't trust wikipedia whatever you do trust the church though don't you or maybe you don't i don't know but whoever you trust somebody's got a record of that like that's real facts it wasn't covered in mud ever it wasn't ever dug out of mud ever that's not recorded in any of this You've got artists' impressions, but since photography has begun, you've got photographs. Um, and it's not just... See, the thing is, it's not just one artist's impression. It's also referenced in media. For example, uh, I wonder if Shakespeare refers to St. Paul's. Let's find out. Shakespeare, St. Paul's... Pup quote. Pup quote. Uh, the influence from St. Paul's on Shakespeare's work... Richard the Third and Saint Paul Shakespeare. Uh, Saint, he talks about Saint Paul. Um, I'm not finding a specific, you know, Saint Paul's Cathedral quote from Shakespeare. But you see what I'm saying? What I'm trying to do is look for a piece of literature that might reference, because people were writing books and things at the time as well. So I'm sure that there's going to be other forms of cross-reference that we can do. Um, just going to quickly click this first thing that came up just to see if they've got any evidence because they're talking about the influence of St. Paul on Shakespeare's work. The environment around London... Sorry. Bye-bye. The environment around London's great landmark was important in shaping the plays of Shakespeare's time. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, doggy. They're talking about the Great Fire in 1666. People of all walks of life flocked there. Oh, look, you see, here you go. Uh, they gave them the nickname Paul's Walkers as they wandered up and down, seeking out the latest news and meeting up with others to discuss business and politics. It was like a meeting place. And Thomas Decker captures a sense of the atmosphere of Paul's Walk in his pamphlet, The Dead Term, 1608, in which he presents the complaint of Paul's steeple. What swearing is there? Yea, what swaggering, what facing and outfacing, what shuffling, what shouldering, what jostling, what jeering, what biting of thumbs to beget quarrels. Um, that's a term because I bite my thumb at you. I bite my thumb at you. Was, uh, I bite my thumb at you. It was like doing that. It was like doing that. Like that. They don't do that anymore. So it's of a time, that sort of uh, that idea. So there's another way of cross-referencing, not just what was written, but when and, and for why. Uh, biting of thumbs to beget quarrels. What holding up of fingers to remember drunken message meetings. What braving with feathers. What bearding with mustachios. What casting of open cloaks to publish new clothes. There's a quote from a thing written about St. Saint... <laughs> Saint Paul's Cathedral. There's a quote. Look, there it is. There's the actual pamphlet. We've got we've got a, a copy of it. This is obviously a, a copy of the copy. You know, it's a photographed copy, but it, that's the actual pamphlet. We've got them. We can we can age it with carbon dating if we want. So you know, we've got this cross referencing idea in history. History is not just somebody showing you a picture and saying it's this and it's that. History is being able to cross reference all those different ideas and say, well, you recorded it over there and you recorded it over there and you didn't know each other, but you both recorded it. You know what I'm saying? People, okay, people might have met each other in London. But you got people from America coming to London and writing their books and then going back to America. You got people from China coming and saying what they think and going back. It's all about cross-reference. We can do that with history.
we can do that. So I can't cross-reference any of this because I'm not going to be able to just geo-guess exactly which city or when this is. But if it is a photograph, then it will be recorded. Who took it and why? If it was for structural engineering purposes to record and document the laying of the railway, which is what this looks like, uh, then they would have recorded it and we could find it out. The Royal Observatory at Greenwich in London became the world's prime meridian in 1851. Prior to the time of moving it to Greenwich in England, the Great Pyramid of Giza was the ancient prime meridian of the Earth. Okay, you see this, I praised her earlier for not getting on with a load of waffle, but she's doing this now. Why are we stating these random weird facts? And they just state them and then move on. There's no evidence for it again. So I'm just going to have to go back because the prime meridian. In 1851. So civilization. The Royal Observatory at Greenwich in London became the world's prime meridian in 1851. Prior to the time of moving it to Greenwich in England, the Great Pyramid of Giza was the ancient prime meridian of the earth. Uh, Greenwich, 1850. The prime meridian was first established by St. George Airy in 1851. And over two thirds of all ships and tonnage used it as the reference meridian on their charts. So I'm not going to, this is just off the top of my head, right? So again, you see the way they throw this down, all these, it's like for home learning, because one of these people that we looked at was a homeschooler. For home learning, this is great because you th get thrown so down many different avenues and you have to learn so much different stuff to make sense of their nonsense that they suggest. They just suggest it and move on. The prime meridian was moved. No, it wasn't. It was first established. What do you mean, first established? Well, well. <laughs> See that line? Before the establishment of a common meridian, most maritime countries established their own prime meridian, usually passing through the country in question. So what we did was we were going around in ships and we were navigating. All right, cat, don't scratch the carpet up. Shakima. Forget it. Um, we were going around on ships and we were using latitude and longitude, navigational tools, meridians for that reason. They're, they're lines that we imagine, imagine going down the, from North Pole to South Pole and we imagine them going, and that's how we navigate on the ships. So there were all sorts of different cultures using their own navigation techniques, imagining their own lines in different places, whatever. But because we established a global empire, I say we, Britain, I'm British, but I don't consider myself to be part of this establishment of a global empire, because I, was, I wasn't alive, I wasn't born. So I don't take any of the credit for any of the good things, and I also don't take any of the shame and and uh, guilt for any of the bad things because I didn't do any of them yeah I'm not a nationalist who believes that my nation this and me and that and my nation I'm made up of all different cultures and ideas that's that's the mixed melting pot which is our common understanding these days and my physical body is a DNA collage of Irish English Scandinavian Indian for me Indian uh, you know different different DNA in me I'm not some magic English been here forever, lived here forever, lived for 200, 500, 1,000 years and I've done everything and everything's on me and I'm responsible for everything. No, we're just born into this world the way it is with the lines drawn the way they've drawn them. And, you know, we claim ownership. We take it into our hearts and our identities to say, I'm waving this flag and it's all about me and this. I'm this, I'm this. But you're not, you're not. And I'm not that, you know, I'm not that history. Uh, that's all stuff that happened before I was born. But hey, so I'm British, but when I say we... I'm talking about the British Empire. I'm not meaning that I'm part of it. So don't get don't get thinking I'm some big headstrong, think I'm better than you. Uh, we're all just the same when we're born, aren't we? So look, Great Britain had a big empire. And because of that, we set the rules. We said where the lines were being drawn. We want it going through Britain because that's easiest for us. We're the ones that have got all the ships out on the sea. We're the ones that are winning all the wars and establishing new colonies around the world. We're the ones setting up the... The new world in America. So we'll put it through our Britain. Put it through there. That's why. It wasn't originally in, in Egypt. It, it, it wasn't originally in Egypt. There was no... Like if the Egyptians put their original meridian through their own country, fine. It's just an imaginary line. There is no meridian. The, the world is a globe, obviously. So... Um, oh, the mouse. Thank you. And... I mean, we're not getting into flat earth, are we? <laughs> Obviously, we're not because we believe in meridians. So, 
we we can't be getting into flat earth can we uh you see these lines all over the, like the, the globe you know that you know that it's just arbitrary isn't it wherever you decide to draw that first line or which bit's the front where's the front of the globe which country goes on the front well britain that's line zero that's the front isn't it oh no it's no it's not you can spin it round, and if you live on the other side you can say we're on the front which bit's the top well we use the poles as the top and bottom because we have a relative magnetic field so we use the poles and we're spinning along that axis so we call that the top and bottom but actually we're just floating in space around the sun there is no top and bottom there's no official front it's just a ball of rock floating in space with our ideas put on it if another alien species were to turn up from the you know from out there in the in the astronomy somewhere if they were to arrive they wouldn't arrive and say look there's point zero let's work off that obviously because it wouldn't be obvious to them because they wouldn't have any connection to Europe or Britain or Africa or any of that they just see it as a glo they'd probably use the poles and the spinning axis they'd probably use that to base things off wouldn't they just maybe who knows they're aliens they might not they, but the bottom line is they wouldn't adhere to our sets of coordinates and details on who's got the first meridian because it's just an idea that's invented in our minds so just going back to this sorry that's the nintendo music i'll be doing that a lot today accidentally pressing the wrong button but going back to this we've only got 50 seconds in and already she's making some really rash quite bizarre nonsensical statements came the world's prime meridian in 1851 prior to the time of moving it to greenwich in england the Great Pyramid of Giza was the ancient prime meridian of the Earth. No, you see, we, that's a silly thing to say. And also, this map isn't an ancient map, so it doesn't. those things don't tie in. And I don't know, you can't really see, because I can't see anything detailed on this map, because I can see it says Lake Victoria, maybe. But other than that, I can't even see if it is marked on the map. But yeah, it's, it wasn't, and it's not, so good. Good one. Someone left me a comment that the trivium was removed in 1850. I have been unable to find an internet source to confirm the date, but the trivium was the lower division of the seven liberal arts of classical education. What? What? See, I told you I'd do it a lot. Uh, trivium. See, this, this, is this to do with fires? <laughs> they're a band. Look, they're a band. That's what's coming up. They're a band. You can go and see them in concert. So, that's not what I'm looking for. The trivium is the lower division of the seven liberal arts. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what are the seven liberal arts? <sighs> Jesus, hang on. This is a lot to take in, isn't it? Uh, scientific arts, arithmetic, geometry were known at the time of Boethius on Humanities, grammologic and rhetoric were grouped to the trivium. It, twofold, several liberal arts were studied in medieval West. We're talking about medieval theories of education. During the Middle Ages, logic came to take precedence over the other parts of the trivium. During the 12th century, so we do know when the trivium was abandoned. Because it would have been different. Well, we do and we don't. It would have been different all over the world. Different theories of education, different curriculums. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the educational curriculum of humanism spread throughout Europe during the 16th century. So there will be. It's not like today where you had, like, for example, in Britain, and I can speak quite clearly about Britain because I know a bit about it. It might be different in America, but in Britain, you've got one government and they set the curriculum. The national curriculum. And what that means is if you're in a school in England, you have to adhere to the national curriculum so that all the kids get a decent education. UK national curriculum. And there will be exemptions. There will be exemptions, I'm sure. Uh, for example... Sorry, I just want a bit of history on this, not the actual... Uh, for example, religious schools may uh, be able to teach slightly different things. But in the main, even if you can teach some slightly different things, you still have to teach the basics, the maths, the English. You know, you, you have to teach the real basics. The curriculum is, is like a baseline for, for running a school. And that ensures that we all get a very similar 
range of education. We could specialise when you do A-levels and GCSEs and further education, you specialise, but we all get that basic grounding that allows us to interact with the world at a certain level. You know, it's, it's good for everyone. It's good. Hello, David. Not Michelle now, the lady fascinated. Right, right. I've only just met Michelle. This is our first video of Michelle's that we're looking into because I thought we'd widen it a bit, but she seems to be a real, a real one, doesn't she, already? A real one. She's thrown us some... Like we're only two minutes into her video and we're 30 minutes into mine because she's thrown us so many curveballs. But if you want to look into the national curriculum, you can see it exists. Right? It exists because, look, Callahan's Great Debate in a sick 1976... So this is quite modern speech. James Callahan launched what was known as the Great Debate, uh, a revolutionary context of its time that it lit a flare that illuminated education reform ever since. The speech was intended to stimulate wide debate on the purpose of education in the UK. So we debated in our Houses of Parliament why we're educating people and for what reason. It was all lit, it's all on record because it's in the Houses of Parliament. They wrote it all down. And this is the 70s. This isn't even like, you know, early, early, woo, woo, can't, can't, can't get any facts because it was the history. No, this is, this is the 70s. So we, we informed, we inst installed the Education Reform Act and the first statutory national curriculum. So what we're saying is, right, before that, before that, all over the world and in all the different places, you had all different ideas about how to teach kids and what they should learn. But this is a particular one. This is the liberal arts education from the Latin liberalis, free and ars, art or principal practice. So it's got a history from the fourth century, the ancient Greeks. It's been used and this particular style of teaching and curriculum has been used and evolved and changed and different people put some stuff in, other people took some stuff out. Wilhelm von Humboldt's educational model in Prussia, now Germany, which later became the role model for higher education in North America, went beyond vocational training and did different things. So they've all been, you know, they've all got spit spitting their different ideas in the, in the big punch bowl and mixing it up. And they've all been taking a big cup of whatever they feel like they like the taste of. Whatever. Okay, that's the history of education. It's big and it's confusing. But it's all written down and you can verify it and cross-reference it and do all that. I'm glad we've got that. I'm glad we've got that. I haven't even scraped the bottom of the barrel yet. Wait till I see... Oh, God. I've got a big list of them, David. I've got a big list of them. And uh, that big list is... Um... Do you know what? That big list is... Quite a big... I don't think I've got enough time in the world... Do you know what? I don't think I've got enough time in the world to finish all of the nonsense that they've been spouting. Because they spout a two-minute bit of nonsense and it takes me half an hour to explain the history of education. I don't need to explain the history of education any further. If anyone wants to learn about it, it's there for them to learn about. Uh, and also, I've had to find out the history of meridians and, navig and ocean navigation, which is tied into the history of the British Empire. So, that was stuck on the end of the history of buildings in London, you, we're trying to use that as a cross-reference with Shakespeare's work so that we can evidence the fact that there was a... Oh, my God, it just gets long, doesn't it? It just gets long. Let's see what else she's saying. Because this video she's done is about fires, for Christ's sake. I haven't even, she even mentioned a From fire yet. grammar, logic, and rhetoric, subjects leading to the development and refinement of critical thinking and speaking skills. Oh, it would be lovely if you had critical thinking, wouldn't it? My research has led me to the conclusion that the Great Frost of Ireland, which took place between 1740 and 1741, was somehow connected to the mud flood cataclysm, and that these events were deliberately caused in order to take control of the planetary grid system. So that's strange, isn't it? Because she just talked about critical thinking, and now she's telling us that her research has led her to believe that the Great Frost and famine in Ireland was connected to the mud flood. Was connected to the mud flood. Now, it's a horrible thing that happened in Ireland. Lots of people died. Lots of people died. I'm not going to make any jokes. Tell you what I'm not doing today. So I'm not doing my funny voice when I'm criticising her, am I? Because I just can't I can't keep it up today. I'm, <laughs> it's just the way I feel. I'm just going to go in, go in raw. But, uh, yeah, I can't... Uh, I don't know where to start with that. Again, this is now, we're only one minute 13 into the video and here's another thing that you have to learn about. You need to know the history of Ireland and the Great Famine in order to debunk this throwaway comment that it's somehow connected with the Great Mud Flood. Well, I'm going to skip over that one because I don't... 
you know, I don't feel like if I keep having to see, I've had to do Greenwich and I've had to do St. Paul and Shakespeare. If I keep doing that, I get nowhere. And I wonder if that's a tactic of these people to throw so much at you that you start to, before it's, do you know when you argue with someone? All right, this is, this is making me think of this. I'm going to go big face. You know, when you have an argument with someone and they say something and you think, oh, right, I've got you there. I've got you because you've just said something that I know is rubbish. And as you start to explain their rubbish to them, you know, and say, look, here, on, I found it on Google. They're already on to the next thing saying, yeah, but I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And you can't, you're like, hang on, I've got this. I have got this. Oh, someone just gave me a call then. It's on silence. So. Um, it, uh, you're like trying to get in a word in edgeways and they're already off with something else. And you, you lose concentration onto what the thing. And by the time you're doing the debunking, the, you, we're not actually even talking about the original subject. And that's, for them, good, because they can never really dig down to a solid, um, a solid, like, we can never get a solid foundation on any one point, because we're not taking the time. And this is one of the problems we saw with this lady that was homeschooling her children the other day, is that we're not experts in all this. This is Irish history. It's covered in general history. But if I want to become an expert in this, which I'm not, I'm going to have to become a bit more of an expert in Irish history, British history, than I am. And I know a little bit about it. I know a little bit about it, but it's so much different stuff, isn't there? And being having a little flavour of everything and being able to say, well, they had a famine in Ireland. That's as much as I know. She's got a book here about the famine. Has she read it? I don't know. It's just a picture off the internet. She knows there was a famine. We'll say that. And then she's going to piece that together. So it just, you're able to, if you want, if you don't have a really solid, good, I mean, how am I going to explain this? I used to be a fencer. I used to be a school schoolboy fencer. I was in the Great British team. I know an awful lot about fencing. I'm a qualified coach up to like level four or whatever. Um, I've been to the world championships at fencing and I've trained other people who went on to win titles. I have uh, not on my own as part of a group did the training um, and uh, I've uh, been around the world fencing to different international competitions. I've won international competitions myself. I'm a little bit of an authority on the old fencing in a way yeah i know a little bit about it but to be honest i don't even know as much as the coaches that taught me and the historians and stuff because i was busy actually doing the fencing i wasn't also learning all the history so even though i'm quite expert i'm not i know how much i don't know about fencing as well right so if you ask me some questions about it i can give you some quite in-depth answers uh so if you were if this was a thing about fencing i'd be able to absolutely know but because i'm not that knowledgeable on this you know, it took me years to get that knowledgeable on fencing. Do I have to get that knowledgeable on Ireland? And we need an expert, don't we? We need someone else who's an expert because I can't be an expert on all of these different fields. Already, we've covered in the first one minute thirty-five, right? In the first one minute thirty-five, we've covered the history of Britain, the Crystal Palace, the exhibitions, the the Industrial Revolution. We had a picture of this, which we don't know what it is or where it's from. So thank God we don't have to talk about that. Um, meridians. The history of navigation, the history of uh, how we, as different cultures, because we she's not just saying one culture, she said the ancient Egyptians as well. So the, the history of how all different cultures navigated and used astrology and, a, and you know, navigational tools and meridians to uh, not just navigate, but also to map the world. We need to know the history of that. Um, here is a map that she said had the pyramids on it, but we can't read it. We also need to know about the history of education. Like the knowing what happened and knowing that it happened is different from like a university standard dissertation on the things that were happening and why. If you understand what I'm saying there, do you, do you know what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Like knowing that it happened is different from having a deep underpinning knowledge of the things that were happening. So already, I'm this is too much for me. I can't do a university level education in all of those fields. I'd be there forever. I, I did economics and sociology at university. So I didn't do the famine in Ireland. So, um, But then nor did she. My research has led me to the conclusion. My research has led me to the conclusion. What research are you doing? You can't just say my research. I'm showing you my research here. I'm using the internet. She said she couldn't find some stuff on the internet before. Is she using libraries? Is she going to the great and ancient libraries of the world that contain the, the you know original texts? Or is she just using it? Has her library up the road in America, wherever she lives, has it got all the details on, on all this information? You need to pull these things together from all over different sources. If you're doing real solid research onto something new that you're uncovering that's like a... 
you know, you need to really get into this research. You probably need to go into different uh, libraries around. The, you know, when I'm saying libraries, I don't just mean your local library where you can borrow a book. I mean the British National History Museum. I mean the uh, the Turkish whatever they've got there. You know, the, there will be original Greek and Roman texts kept in in museums. You need to be able to look at those. Read. You need to become an expert on ancient languages because you're going to need to read into rewritings of history. You can't just say, my research. What did you do? I looked on the internet. Shut up. That the Great Frost of Ireland, which took place between 1740 and 1741, was somehow connected to the mud flood cataclysm, and that these events were deliberately caused in order to take control of the planetary grid system. And Oh, wait, wait, because we throw things in. Uh, now they're deliberately... The mud flood was deliberate now to take control of the planetary grid system. What the fuff is a planetary grid system? Humanity. The free energy electrical system in place around the world prior to this event either was no longer used or desired to be used in the form it was in previously. Wait. Why does that say trivium? Why is it not what I can see? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I messed up. I've messed up somewhere. I've messed up somewhere. Browsing. There you go. Sorry. Right, I'll skip back. This, I can't believe she says this. The free this. energy electrical system in place around the world prior to this event either was no longer used or desired to be used in the form it was in previously. I mean, how am I supposed to deal with that? Michelle, the free energy system used around the world... What free energy system used around the world prior to the Industrial Revolution? Why did we have an Industrial Revolution? Oh, because they took the free energy off us, so now we have to work out a way of making energy. Or wouldn't you just have a revolution where you just go mad and say, give me my chuffing free energy back? <laughs> what free energy? There was no free energy system. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had to have an Industrial Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have revolutionised the world, would it? We'd have been using all that free energy, and we'd have been making all this stuff and doing wonderful things. We wouldn't have been scruffing around living subsistence subsistence lifestyles, serfs and feudalism. We wouldn't have been doing that. We'd have had free energy. No one would have been riding horses because we had free energy. We, why did we exploit all the animals? Why did we have slaves? We didn't even need slaves. We had free energy. Why did... Oh, it's going to make my brain implode. Buildings with pointy bits. Proof, isn't it? This is a... Is this a photograph? No. This is not photographic. You can see it's not photographic because the texture in the sky, I believe. I believe that's enough for us to say this is not a photograph because of the texture in the sky. And also, just behind that spire that's behind my face, so I'm just going to have to use the browser to move it. Just on that spire behind my face, you can see there's lines behind it. That's the way an artist would draw or shade an area, isn't it? So I believe this is not a photograph. In fact, it's definitely not a photograph. The people in the front are clearly like Lowry-esque little painted people it's not a photograph it's a painting so it's a painting of a building and it's got spikes on its what am i going to suggest what am i going to guess there's a flag on one of them maybe they're flagpoles there's a flag on loads maybe they're flag maybe they just don't have flags flying what is the building tell me what it is please so i can reference it this was the exhibition building in market square clock tower in geelong australia oh they actually do for once we we're actually told so this is the mark hang on market geelong Australia. Uh, I, I can't remember all the words she said because I'm not. See, I told you to keep pressing that button by mistake. Um, what is this, honey? Michelle? This was the exhibition building in Market Square Clock Tower in Geelong, Australia. Exhibition building in Market Square Clock Tower. Exhibition building and Market Square Clock Tower tower now she's gonna have a problem here all right 1885 opened in 1881 she's gonna have a problem in here all right she's gonna have a problem because this image is from the royal historical society of victoria so it's verifiable you know like it's not just some made-up rubbish it's a photograph this time Image, it says image. Does that mean it's a photograph or image research purposes? You can get a high resolution copy from them, from the Royal Historical Society. Maker John Norton, 
make a role, create a studio. Is an image inscribed in pen on version uh, measurements? Oh, it's a photograph. Yeah, it says photograph. Okay, it's a photograph. So we've got a photograph of the actual building now. It's from a different angle, I suppose, isn't it? I don't know. We've got a photograph of it. We know when it was built. That's the clock tower itself. Just the tower. It's got a point a bit on top of that. We know when it was built. We know for why it was built. We've got the history. It's all been recorded. Yeah? Now, she's going to suggest in some way that this building... She is suggesting, not just going to suggest. She is suggesting that this building, that clock tower's in the background there, I think. The spire behind my head, isn't it? Behind my head there, that's the clock tower. This is a different uh, angle of the building, I'm guessing. The building that's behind it. So those those spires would be off, just off shot. Um, she's suggesting this was already in existence. That this was, uh, those spires are proof of the free energy, wasn't she? So this building already lived. All right, Margo. I'm just going to have to go and let Milo out the back. Daddy's just on the internet, son. Daddy's just on the internet. So she's suggesting that this building existed in the past before and it was part of a free energy system that was shut down by the mud flood. So this would have been covered in... All right, it's even annoying Marlo. This would have been, this would have been covered in mud, but it wasn't. Marlo, stop it now. Enough now, thanks. But it wasn't. It definitely wasn't. It was built in 18... Was it built in 1885? Or is Marlo, enough please. Daddy's concentrating. Um, opened in 1881, so it was built in the late 1800s. Um, wooden flagpole, stone spires. No idea how these materials are supposed to transmit energy. Surely a copper cable would be far better. Yeah, exactly. She, she doesn't even have a, 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 a concept of... You know, they, they say these things, don't they? They just say these things like, there was a free energy system. All right. Gla oh, oh, that's interesting. What's your evidence? Well, I've, the buildings look a bit funny. No, no, I mean, what's your evidence for the free energy system? Well, the buildings have got a, a like, I don't recognize that sort of architecture. I'm, I'm not very familiar with architecture. Uh, so you've got an architecture degree and you've done a historical study of, you, you, no, I just, I didn't go to. The other thing I'd like to know is does Michelle have a degree? Does Michelle have a degree in any form? Uh, it's not that the degree makes you some super smarty. You don't have to go to university. But if you are a bit of a smarty, and if you do go to university, you might be able to study this. You might be able to write your dissertation on this, and it can go and be part of the record like everyone else's historical record and dissertation. You can be part of the people that write these things. You don't have to be on the outside of the tent. You can get in the tent. You can get yourself a degree and become one of the historians. But you're not, are you? You're just some person who didn't really... Did you do well at school, Michelle? How well did you handle school? Did you find it easy to learn? Did you find your lessons and exams were a joy? Did you want to go on to higher education? Was that part of you? Or were you more interested in messing about with your mates? And I don't know. I'm asking a question. I'm asking a question. But it's quite often these people who throw up all these conspiracy theories, certainly the ones around my way that I meet in the pub, that I meet in the pub. They're not the same people who were interested in history at school. Quite often they're people who didn't do very well at school. And I think that's part of the reason they don't have this underpinning knowledge to be able to say, oh, that looks a bit different. I can explain it with my underpinning knowledge. Instead, they have to make up fantasies because they don't know. But David's told us here, look, something quite straightforward about the materials. Because he's got underpinning knowledge. So, Michelle... Michelle is assuming this is a free power system. And that isn't even this video. That's not what this video is about, is it? Australia, with its incredible design features and what look like lightning rods and flagpoles. It looks like lightning rods and flagpoles. Well, they look like flagpoles. They've got flags on them, well spotted. Lightning rods are used, aren't they? They are used to prevent places from burning down when they get hit by lightning. So she spotted that as well. But a uh, free power system, if you're going to suggest it, this is what I was saying just a minute ago, if you're going to suggest it, you've got to be able to then say, because you can generate free power from, right? They have loads, she's got loads of videos on her channel that have some weird ideas like a magnetron or something. But 
but you can't just say probably this you've got to give some more evidence haven't you? you've got to say there's got to be you know not just it's a building with a thing on top free power like, I'll tell you what, if it was taken off us and taken away and, and hidden from us, but we've been using it for, say, a thousand years, then there'd be lots of evidence of it. There'd be lots of records of it. People have written down, you know, on the back of their... It doesn't have to be in a history book now, because it would have been so ubiquitous throughout the world that someone would have written it down on the back of their... Uh, you know, oh, reminder to mom to uh, turn on the free power machine tonight before I go to bed or, you know, make sure to pick up another free power battery before I, you know, there'd have been like little notes, little, just, just chit chat about the free power, just recorded all the way through history, in, in plays and uh, uh, books and poetry, you know, the mentions of the fact that they don't have to worry because they've got free power would have come up a lot, wouldn't it? Instead, they talk all about how they have to farm and scruff and surf and, when I say surf, I mean S-E-R-F, I don't mean surf on surfboards, they talk about how they have to suffer and you know, they talk about the feudal system, don't they? And how they had to suffer and struggle and farm and fight wars. And, you know, I don't know. They, they don't end up... To, why do we fight all those wars? Why do we need sails on ships? There's so much to unpack. <laughs> Perhaps originally in place for receiving and transmitting energy. The clock tower was demolished in 1923 and the remaining buildings were demolished in the early 1980s to make room for a new shopping center. The free energy system was ultimately replaced with other forms of energy that could be monetized and controlled. So the free energy system was replaced by... The free energy system was replaced by forms of energy that could be monetized... I don't like this song. Let's have something a bit more relaxing, please. That was getting a bit... The free energy system is replaced by something that could be monetized. Well, that was mean of them wasn't it when that happened you'd be up in arms no one would put up, would put up with that no one would put up with that would they we had a free energy system and they said we're going to knock down this building this building that we know when it was built this building that you know has historical record in photographs from before it was built and then after it was built we're going to knock that down your free energy center's going we're getting rid of that and we're going to put up a shopping centre. There was no official, you know, day of switch off, was there? There was no day of switch off. Free energy's going though. We're getting rid of that. We're putting up a shopping centre. How do you like that? Oh, I'm happy with that. I prefer to have an energy bill than no energy bill. Yeah. I just don't see it myself. Trams around the world, which had been powered by electricity, were pulled by mules until perhaps the time the electrical system was figured out. Trams that had been powered by electricity were pulled by mules until we could figure out the electrical system. I mean, come off it. Come off it. You think there was tram lines and trams kicking around. We discovered them, dug them out of the mud and said, these look good. I wonder how we'll work these. Wow, there must have been a free power system. We haven't got one of them. Let's work out our own system. Let's try and work it out. No. Obviously not. We've got records of when the tram lines were laid. They're post-industrial revolution. So we've got record. Like, not just like, you know, someone made it up and... We've got like... It's making me feel a bit funny, actually, because... I mean, how can you be that ignorant to suggest that before electricity, the electrical stuff was there and we just didn't know how to use it? Like what you see in the foreground of this photo from the Southern Exposition of Louisville. That Excuse me? Like what you see in the foreground of this photo from the Southern Exposition of Louisville. It's a photo! That's a photo! She could have just been, you know, that could have just been a slip of the tongue. I'm not going to beat her up over that because that, that, you can't possibly think that's a photo, can you? Bill, that went on from 1883 to 1887. And what? when powering once again by electricity. Hang on, hang on, hang on. She just left that. She didn't she didn't uh, she didn't qualify this. She didn't qualify this with any uh statement of fact. It's just a picture of the, the people. There's a tram. Looks like it's on train tracks. 
Looks like it's been pulled by donkeys. Now, this will blow your mind, right? But when they laid the train tracks, <laughs> they had donkeys around. When they first laid these tram tracks, I don't even know if that's an original electric tram. It might be a steam tram. It might be a chuffing donkey tram, for all I know. I'm not an expert on trams, but I, I am an expert on common sense. And I will say that before you put the trains down, there are no electricity train tracks. And then you put them down and you need some like mechanism to put them down. You need some labor, you know, the donkeys there. Perhaps this is the first time they're putting this tram on the tracks. So perhaps to get it on the tracks, they need to put it on the tracks before they can set it off with its steam or electric power or whatever. So they need the donkeys to put it on the tracks. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that. And when powering once again by electricity was figured out, within a few decades, largely replaced by cars and buses in most of the cities they were in, like Montgomery, Alabama. No. That's, that may be the case in America, like Montgomery, Alabama. I'm not an expert in America. But in Europe and other places, trams and electric transport were not completely replaced by cars and buses. We, in, we integrate the two. And if you go to any European city now, although there may have been a time where we thought, oh, look, these motor cars are going to be better than the trams. Like, you know, there may have been differences of opinion. You, you might also notice there's no roads there. There's none of our modern roads there. Is that mud flood? It's mud flooded. No, they just haven't finished building the tram. Like, uh, if you go to any European city, there will be trams running alongside, if not more predominant in the more public pedestrian style areas. We're moving away from the motor vehicle now, aren't we? Montgomery is one of three places that I know of. That's a contradiction as they'd be under the mud flood anyway. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point, isn't it? These things are underneath the... F why aren't we digging out all these free power electrical goodies from... Why are all the stuff in ancient Egypt made of stone? Why aren't all these free power electrical goodies? Why can't I dig a Game Boy out of my back garden, archaeology style? It should only be one floor down, shouldn't it? Game Boys and Nintendos and all sorts of cool stuff that didn't require, had magic power. Why weren't they playing computer games? Why did no one know what a computer was? Why, weren't they, why aren't they hieroglyphs of like Game Boys and Nintendos? Said to have had the first citywide system of electric streetcars in 1886, which was known as the Lightning Route. The streetcars were retired in a big ceremony and replaced by buses in 1936. So they are going to put in all the time, energy, money, and effort to develop an efficient mass transportation system like this and then only use it for 50 years? Yes, that's exactly what happened. You just explained it. What happened was for 50 years they used that and it was all right, but then the motor vehicle became more common. It became cheaper for people to buy cars the purchase of cars became more common. So more and more cars were on the roads. They had to say, look, there's cars going all around now. Uh, are the trams and the cars going to stay in the same place? What are we going to do? Well, no, we're going to now like listen to the people. They want to drive their own motor vehicles. And we're going to add buses in for public transport. We're going to allow that to take over. And also there were big petroleum companies who were setting agendas, weren't there? You know, all this reset and new world order and all this. It's not, it's not all... Um, it's not all complete rubbish when you consider that there were clandestine, you know, great big enterprise, big companies, oil and and uh, oil and governance worked hand in hand to create systems that benefited the people that were selling the oil. So uh, David says, I spent the last 40 years looking at excavations and never seen any of the previous mud flood civilization. You know, if we dug stuff up, uh, we'd find it, wouldn't we? Apparently we did and we did. And uh, that's why we've got it now. That's where all, that's the house you're living in. Go down and look in the basement. I don't have a basement here because I don't know why. But um, go down and look in the basement. <laughs> There'll be a front door somewhere. Look, the uh, <laughs> the idea that petroleum took over is quite a standard and normal understood one. It's all, you know, written down. And then, obviously, if you look now, electric trams and things are becoming more popular because we didn't know about pollution back then as much, did we? We didn't realise the damage we were doing. So things change. That's normal. If you see in this picture, you don't see many motor vehicles. Not many. It's a bit different now, isn't it? I am going to start by looking at the Great Hamburg Fire of 1842. Right. She's going to start by looking at it. I'm already an hour into the video. <laughs> 
I've, I'm trying really hard. I said at the start of this episode that I would just let it play and stop going on Google all the time. I've done loads of Google now. So now for the last section of my video, so it doesn't go on for hours and hours and hours and hours. So it doesn't go on for hours and hours and hours and hours. I know some streamers do and it's normal to, you know, if you're a streamer, you just have the computer on. I'm not like that. I do little like chunks, episodes, and then I go and walk the dog and come back and what have you. So let's listen to her for an unadulterated chunk without me. I'll try my hardest not to interrupt. And I don't know a lot about Hamburg and the Hamburg fire. So we'll just listen to some ideas. And at the end, we'll bring up some other ideas, hopefully, that counter it, you know, a little bit. But let's just see what, what goes on. It is noteworthy that the fire took place in the Hamburg Altstadt and started on May 5th on the Dijkstrasse, or Dijk Street, which is the oldest remaining street in the old city of Hamburg. It was said to burn for three days before being extinguished. That looks bad. Um, I've seen a Roman burial just a few feet down and a similar depth medieval murder victim. <laughs> Funny how that happens. Destroying about a third of the buildings in the Altstadt and killing 51 people. Interesting to note that there was a heavy demand on insurance companies that led to the establishment of reinsurance or insurance for insurance companies. It means, I feel like she's reading this off Wikipedia. Hang on. Hamburg. I told you I wouldn't do this and I'm doing it now. <laughs> told you I wouldn't do this, but I'm doing it now. Great fire of Hamburg. The way she's just, like, you know, got these side facts. Um, it burned until the morning of May the 8th, destroying about one third of the buildings in the old start. It killed 51 people. That's the fact she's saying, isn't it? Well, and it was led to the establishment of reinsurance. That she's reading it off Wikipedia. Look, that statement there. The Great Fire of Hamburg began on May fifth in Deistrab and burned until the morning of May eighth, destroying about one third of the buildings in the old state. It killed fifty-one people, one thousand seven hundred residencies, um, and it. The heavy demand on insurance companies led to the establishment of reinsurance. It's just like a little fact they pop in on Wikipedia there, and she said those exact words. Hasn't she? In her research. Well, interesting to note that there was a heavy demand on insurance companies that led to the establishment of reinsurance. Exact words. Plagiarized from Wikipedia. Mic drop. I keep pressing the wrong button. Mic drop from me. That's a mic drop from me, isn't it? Well done, Michelle. Michelle Gibson, with your research, you found Wikipedia. But Wikipedia's been written by the chuffing bad people! Wikipedia's been written by the devil, hasn't it? If I'm going to use Wikipedia to debunk you, and these people tell me, they tell me, you can't trust Wikipedia. Anyone can write any old shit on Wikipedia. That's not facts. But actually, and I've heard this so often, you know, when people talk about the internet, ha, oh, Wikipedia, you can't, but you can, because it is facts, because they back it up with, with these references, and if it's not right, someone else will come along and say, that's rubbish, get rid of it. And as a society, that's how we, that, that is how we do our history and everything. Some people say, look, here's my facts, my facts, this is the stuff that I suggest, I'm backing up with this, this, and this. You cross-reference it with that, and you tell me what you think. And, you know, the, Dissertation gets handed in, the uh, the book gets written, the, the peers review it. The other historians go, look at those facts, they're interesting. Yeah, I like that, that's interesting. I'll write a book, a similar book about similar things. We'll go review mine, what do you think? We develop this this body of knowledge. It's all cross-referenceable. All... So Wikipedia is the same as that in my mind. It's a bit more freeform. Okay, I can write some lies on here right now. Chuk, 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 typing in my lies. It's body of knowledge. Uh, I can I can typey typey in my eyes. I hope my microphone's not going. <coughs> tell me if it does. Um, I can type because every time I bang the table, I dislodge that wire sometimes. Um, typey in my eyes. I could do that right now, and people will say Wikipedia's full of lies. But they'll see it's full of lies and they'll delete them. I won't be able to back up my lies with a quote from a, a scientific paper or book or you know evidence. I won't be able to evidence my lies, so they will end up getting deleted. And over time, only the truth will stand. That's the way I think about Wikipedia. I don't think of it as a load of nonsense that can just be made up. But the people that don't want you to use it as evidence, 
that don't that want you to have to look a bit further, that want you to do a bit more digging. Like if I was to do a dissertation for a university about history, I couldn't use Wikipedia. I'd have to do my own digging. I'd have to read these books myself. The further reading, all that. I'd have to read all that myself and pick out my own quotes, make my own Wikipedia page. That's the way you have to do that. But for normal people like like me, I'm quite happy to look at Wikipedia and say that is a, a fair a fair go at some facts. I can cross reference it with their other pages, their other ideas. I can look at other in like if I want to really find out about reinsurance, I don't have to just use Wikipedia now. I can use it as a jumping off point, and I can Google, and I can go further into other places. So that's fine. But what I'm surprised at is Michelle herself is using Wikipedia, and I know it because she's ev she's literally read out that sentence I don't think that's good enough Michelle I don't think that's good enough for you I think it's okay for me I don't think it's good enough for you <laughs> or insurance for insurance companies to insulate them from major claims events I wonder how this factors into the fire the fire was said to have begun in Edward Cohen's cigar factory and that it quickly spread through the wooden, half-timbered buildings of Hamburg. The Great Fire was also said to have destroyed the city's town hall, which was said to have been rebuilt starting in 1886 and opening in 1897. And the Nikolai Kircha, or Church of St. Nicholas, which was said to have been rebuilt by 1874. Here's another view of the Nikolai Kircha in the Hamburg Altstadt with a beautiful stone and brick masonry bridge, as well as other. It's not a particularly good view, is it? There's a tree in the way. A beautiful infrastructure combining stone and brick. Other interesting architecture of Hamburg includes this location with buildings on what looks like an artificial island situated in the middle of a canal connected by bridges to the towering buildings on with what looks like she says so she doesn't know what this is or where it is so is it hamburg even is this let me guess is this a picture on the wikipedia please be on the wikipedia please it would make me laugh look that picture's on the wikipedia she used that in her video but i tell you what these people don't do much they're not they're lazy right so watch this um not watch this Boom, there it is. First picture. Like th first page, first... It's not the same picture, but it's obviously one of the most main... Look, it's on the first page of Google Images, that picture. So I'm sure that... Look, there it is again. There it is again, you see. Maybe her particular Google... You know, maybe she used some other words with Hamburg. She brought that image up. She's got it, boom. There's the picture. There it is again. These people are lazy, aren't they? They're not even doing the research. I wonder what that is. I can't tell you. Well, I can tell you because it's the... Uh, they're not... It's not under any of these. I'll tell you, though. I'll tell you. Look, I'll find out. It can't be that hard to find out, can it? Look. Uh, I don't want any of you chuffing any of that. Thank you. Uh, it's the water castle. The water castle. There you go. Where's her video? It's night time on her video. Got so many windows open now, I'm getting confused, sorry. It's night time on her video. Is it that one? Is that is that it? The Alame The Alame stock photo. Is that it? Not quite. It's very close though, isn't it? I'm guessing she's just got a stock photo of Hamburg then. It really, you know, for her to make a video like that and for me to be able to find these. We did it with um, the lady yesterday, Shelley yesterday, she's called. Uh, she put up all these pictures that were just the first thing that came up on Google search. So they're not doing proper research. They're just getting the first thing off Google and then reinterpreting it however they want. Uh, the water castle is it's a UNESCO site look it's a UNESCO site would somebody just I don't want your trip advisor and all that I just want to you know 
Okay, we'll just say what is. It'll tell us there. It's the world's largest comp. No, not that. Uh, I wanted to just know what it is. Okay. What is... There's so much um, commerce surrounding it that you can't find out the information these days, look. Is that, is that the site with the information? The world's largest warehouse complex is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a complex of warehouses built into the Elba River between 1883 and the 1920s. It's built in the... It, it's finished in the 1900s. What are the... It's a 19... It's like a modern building then, yeah? Brilliant. I'm just going to turn off some of these windows because I've got so many of them open. Look at all the stuff we've been learning about today, yeah? Uh, it's in the 1900s. On both sides of it. And this massive building in Hamburg, perfectly framed by an archway. Just like the ancient temple in Carthage, perfectly framed by the archway and shown in the last video. What? There's some connection between those two things because the photographer of this looked at it through an archway. It's not perfectly framed through an archway if you stood on the other side. If you stood by those cars, it's not framed by anything. You just stood in front of it. But if you find yourself an archway and stand there and look through it, it's framed. The same as this. Exact same as this. Do you know what? Watch. Same as me. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, Michelle. You've gone full fruit nuts on me now. Full fruit nuts on me now. Even David's in on it as well, look. Back, brick, bricks are used as batteries to store the free energy. Are you saying that? Because I think David's making that up as a joke. But I also think he might be referencing one of their wacky theories because, you know, I don't know anymore. I can't tell between fact and fiction. Maybe that's where they want us to go, where you just get so confused that you can't tell between fact and fiction. That's where they are. Framed by the archway and shown Perfect. in the last video. It's This is perfectly framed by this archway, unless you stand three feet to the left, in which case it's not anymore, because it's just a, a matter of perspective and... Oh! <laughs> On an interesting side note, the first railway line in Hamburg, between Hamburg and Bergedorf, was opened on May 5th, 1842. Interesting side note. Is it... is it... is it listed in here? Is it listed in here? This interesting side note. Railroad, first railroad connection. And I'm trying to skim read this. My guess is that interesting side note is also on this Wikipedia page because that's all she's nearly swore. I don't like to swear on stream because this is an open forum. Anyone could be watching. I like to, you know, maintain my composure and not get all swout, shouty sweary. But, uh, but, you know, my, my instinct is to feel that she's only just read the fucking Wikipedia page. Um, it's all part of the mudflood dance. It is part of the mudflood. Batteries, red brick batteries. Damn it. Damn it. If only Elon Musk knew about this. If only the top... But they're trying to hide it from us, aren't they? Elon Musk will be trying to hide it from us. He won't be trying to harness the red brick battery for all of our benefits. He'll be trying to hide it from us so that he can charge us money for energy so if only we knew about this why did they let us build our houses out of now why are we allowed to we reclaim bricks at the builder's yard when you do a, a build because i've done some building work myself over my years um you knock down old brick you, re, you knock off the cement off them you reclaim them you don't just throw them in the skip you can reclaim the bricks you can reuse them they shouldn't be letting us do that they should be taking them away smashing them up bricks are literally made of mud bricks are literally made of mud the mud flood have they? Hang on! Wait, 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 wait! This is how they work. This is how they work, right? This is this is how this is how these people work. Is bricks are made of mud, right? This is my brain now. This is what's going on in my brain. Bricks are made of mud. There's been a mud flood. The bricks are the free energy. There's been a mud flood. The mud flood is the result of the escaping or the destruction of the free energy system, because we know from entropy. We know about entropy, that energy's got to go somewhere, hasn't it? Energy's got to go somewhere. So, I figured it out. 
they destroyed the free energy system. When they did, that energy had to go somewhere. And there's chuffing loads of it. And it's free. So what it did is that energy melted all the buildings. All the buildings that are made of bricks became mud. Red hot mud, probably. And that shook an earthquake the world. Which meant that the sun turned to mud, remember? The sun turned to mud. We don't need that anymore. Oh, I tapped the microphone then. I hope I'm not going... And that shook... I seem to be all right. Uh, so that's what's happening, isn't it? That The whole world melted all the bricks because the free energy got loose and that it sunk everything into the mud. That's probably it. That's probably it. How should I verify that? I'll have a look all on a Wikipedia and I'll make a video and that's me done. I don't have to check and cross-reference and find any evidence of. That's, that's me done. I've had a funny idea and I've paired it with another funny idea. And there we go. Funny idea combo. It's a bit like writing books, isn't it? On the exact same day, the Great Fire started. This was the Bergedorf station in Hamburg, used only for four years between 1842 and 1846. What a waste. In July of 1845, a Great Fire was said to break out in New York City. It was said to have started in a whale oil and candle manufacturing establishment. You... In you oh, can't be using decades, largely New York, by cars New and York and America. And look, city. look, you've got America there. Now, again, we've got America here. You can't be doing New York. Like, it's been written down. There's no confusion about what happened in New York, is there? No one is ever confused about what's ever happened in New York, ever, because it's all been written down. We went out there on boats with, like, modern New Worlds. The New Worlds. It's called the New World, not the old... World, is it? Wooden structures in lower Manhattan. Making it up. Firemen battling the blaze were said to have been aided by water flowing from their cotton aqueduct. I'm not going to look into the New York fire now. There's too much for me to get my head around. As I said, I'm just going to let this flow for a bit and I'm just going to say when I think it's getting ridiculous. And when it's obvious that I can, you know, really slam in a debunk, I will. But it just, you know, if you want to look into the New York thing, that's a different episode because it could be, couldn't it? It could be a whole episode on the New York fire said to have been completed in 1842, which was the same year as the Hamburg Fire. We are told the 1845 Great Fire of New York destroyed 345 buildings in the southern part of the financial district. This fire was said to confirm the effectiveness of restricting the building of wood frame structures as areas which were rebuilt after the 1835 Great Fire of New York were of stone, masonry, iron roofs, and iron shutters. Right. So that's a point in history that we can reference. Because of these fires that started breaking out in big international cities in the modern world, we decided wood be, wood is no good. Wood's no good. It's time to ditch wood and start building in more, more less flammable materials. Wood's no good. So that happened not just in Hamburg, but also in, in New York. It's like a global... You know, we can see when that happened and, and how we can then look at the buildings and how they changed over the years. And we can say, oh, look, they started building out of this more than that now. And we can reference it through our historical records. So it goes against the idea that there was a mud flood and a reset because we've got it all recorded, not just recorded and written down in, in blueprints and records and architectural and all that. Not just that, but we've actually got the physical buildings that still stand. Some that don't, some that were burned, some that were damaged and some that still stand. We've got it all. Got the fossil, like the equivalent of a fossil record, and a, a written like history, and we've got the history of, uh, like I said, throughout literature, you'll get like literature that references things that actually really happened. So you know you'll get another form of being able to cross-reference throughout the arts and culture. People have talked about it, made little notes, written things down, painted a picture. The 1845 fire was said to have destroyed buildings from below Wall Street on Broad Street. Excuse me. Stones. Excuse me. What are all those people doing in the picture? Why are they not covered in mud? Have these buildings just been dug out from the mud? Then why are all these people there? Because they're not on the reset. It looks like we've got the uh, instigations of the first motor vehicle transport system there. 
on the roads. And it looks like people are beginning to behave as we behave now by not walking free for all in the roads and mainly on the pavements. You can start to see the, uh, the beginnings of that population building, can't you? There's more people in the pictures. Wall Street on Broad Street. To Stone Street. This looks like a, uh, a, a, a photograph that's been either, you know, heavily stylized or even a nice, accurate, you know, a very accurate painting. Uh, it looks like a postcard or uh, a Christmas card, doesn't it? It looks a bit like a Christmas card. There's a modern road sign in there. There's a modern road sign in there. So we know it's pretty damn modern. Up Whitehall Street to Bowling Green. And up Broadway to Exchange Place. These places pictured in New York City have incredibly large buildings of heavy masonry or bricks. When were these built? <laughs> when were these built? Who can say? Who can say? We couldn't possibly find out. The Great Pittsburgh Fire was said to have happened in the same year. On April 11th of 1845. The Great Pittsburgh Fire was said to have been started by a woman who worked for Colonel Deal on Ferry Street who had just stoked a fire to heat wash water. This is a detail. From See this is what I was saying though it's it's not strange to believe is it that we had loads of buildings built with wood and old materials and they were jammed in cheap by jowl. The busy populated areas would have been busy and populated and they had a lot of wooden structures cheap by jail less planning permission more stuff just shonked up you know maybe in a, a alleyway here someone's put up a bit of a shed and maybe in a tight street there someone's put their their you know do you know what i'm saying maybe they've got a bloke with a wheelbarrow full of selling his nuts and you've got all this stuff going on these tight streets all made of wood the old style and at the same time you've got the industrial revolution taking over so now you've got steam power you've got uh engines and uh machinery it's not just horses pulling things anymore those steam power look, look at all these boats on the water they've got furnaces powering that steam haven't they furnaces powering the steam these buildings these old wooden buildings that were used to housing a, fir a fireplace maybe a fireplace are now situated next door to a great big factory the furnace you know you've got these industrial areas building up around the town and uh stoking fires with the new with the new technology that we had, the industrial technology, you've got more coal going around now, haven't you? And you've got uh, all your stuff. It, it just seems more dangerous. So all of a sudden, all that flammable material and all those powerful furnaces don't seem to mix so well. So it's no wonder that things went on fire and they decided to re reevaluate how the health and safety of these things and what they're building them out of. From a Nathaniel Courier print. This is a good place to insert that famous artists and authors were part of creating the new historical narrative. Oh history. God, they're not. You can't use artists and authors. You can't use them as evidence that things happened because they were part of the conspiracy. They're all lying. Why didn't one of them tell the truth? They'd have been the most famous artist. They'd have been the most famous lawyer. They'd have been the most famous author because they were the one whistleblowing. They could have had a little group doing it. Why didn't anyone... Who's paying them to tell the lies and for why? ...imprinted in our consciousness and taking our attention away from questioning what is actually in the environment around us. Charles Dickens was said to have described Pittsburgh in 1842 as a city that had a great quantity of smoke hanging over it. In spite of having no formal education, after having left school to work in a factory because his father was in debtor's prison, he had it. Listen, back then, not many people had a formal education, not in the way you would probably reference it today. We've already looked at that. Education was in flux, wasn't it? Some people learned Latin at school, like Shakespeare. Uh, even since Shakespeare's time, education has been... But he probably did get... I mean, I don't know what Charles Dickens' education was like. I don't want to keep doing this. I want to let it flow, but Charles... Dickens' education. 
He attended the Giles Academy in Chatham for about a year, so he did get an education. When he was 12, he attended the Wellington House Academy in London. At 15, family problems required him to work. So from then on, at 15, he was self-taught. But most people didn't go on... You know, there were universities then, but most people, most normal people, didn't go on at school much longer than that anyway because... uh, you know, the, in, the, in the Industrial Revolution, there were children working in the factories that didn't even go to school at all. So he did seem to get a reasonable education for the time. So she's misrepresenting him now. He did a weekly journal for 20 years, wrote 15 novels, five novellas, and hundreds of short stories and articles. He's one of many famous and incredibly accomplished people I have come across in my research, said to have little or no training in their respective fields including art and architecture. Uh, Charles Dickens wasn't the an architect. The third Presbyterian. Charles Dickens wasn't... Did you say... Hang on, let me just get this straight. Who am I talking about here? Darwin, aren't I? Dickens or Darwin? Let me... Let me just get my confusion because I'm trying to make sure the music's playing as well. his father was in debtor's prison. He edited a weekly journal for 20 years, wrote 15 novels, five novellas, and hundreds of short stories and articles. He's one of many famous and incredibly accomplished people I have come across in my research, said to have little or no training in their respective fields, including art and art. Charles Dickens was... Dickens, sorry, Dickens, okay. (sighs) (sighs) Said to have described Pittsburgh in 1842 as a city that had a great quantity of smoke hanging over it. In spite of having no formal education, after having left school to work in a factory because his father was in debtor's prison, he edited a weekly journal for 20 years, wrote 15 novels, five novellas, and hundreds of short stories and articles. He's one of many famous and incredibly accomplished people I have come across in my research said to have little or no training in their respective fields. Uh, His respective field of writing, writing fiction. Now, back then, it wasn't that... I mean, even now, you don't have to have a a formal training in writing fiction to write a good story, do you? Some people just have a natural... this, This is arts, so some people have a bit of natural flair. But he did have a formal education. He did have a formal education. He went to two notable educational establishments... And uh, then he wrote loads of... And he worked for uh, newspapers, didn't he? Uh, So you don't... um, Left school at 12, this one says. After three years, he returned to school. So he did leave school, but he returned. So she's misrepresenting him. Uh, Oh, and look, this this is her again. Dickens edited a weekly journal for 20 years, wrote 15 novels, five novellas, hundreds of short stories and non-fiction articles. She's reading off the Wikipedia again. So what you need to realise is if you edited a weekly journal for 20 years, right, uh, when Dickens entered the world of work in... Where is it? I was, uh, I was led to believe that he published his stories in newspapers... His, his success began with the 1836 serial publication of the Pickwick Papers, uh, sparked merchandise, and it was his first novel. Okay, it was a straight-up novel. I thought he wrote through a news... Okay, fine. Cliffhangers in his serials kept people in suspense. I knew that. I thought the cliffhangers... I thought it was published in a, in a newspaper just off the top of my head, but it wasn't. His original things were just published... Uh, Journalism and early novels. There we go. Look, journalism and early novels. Uh, he submitted his stories to a London periodical monthly magazine. Sketches and periodicals, collections of pieces. And then he was asked to contribute to street sketches. Dickens became a regular visitor to Fulham House, excited by Hogarth's friendship with Walter Scott, whom Dickens greatly admired. So while he's young and he's submitting his early stories to these publications, he's mixing with people who he uh, sees as not just peers, but 
um, people who he respects. So he's learning from these people. He made rapid progress professionally and socially. So he learned, he's learning. When he starts writing the Pickwick papers, he's already uh, been friends with, look, no, it's Benjamin Disraeli, the Prime Minister, the Earl of Beaconsfield. Uh, he, he attended this salon, this bachelor salon, this club, where these people would hang around and meet. And he talked to these top people. So he's learning, isn't he? He's not just uh, ignorant. He's learned and learning. And all these people would have been talking about all this interesting stuff. And he's ended up becoming a notable author in his own right. But he's done a sort of apprenticeship, learning from and working with all these other people. I would say. Including art and architecture. The Third Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh was said to have stopped the progress of the fire in its direction, only losing a wooden cornice. And this is what would have happened is church buildings obviously built by stone, stonemasons. I think you had Italian stonemasons going over to the New World and slave labor and the church had loads of money. So they built stone buildings. And when you had these great fires, they didn't burn these buildings down. So that's where you get a fire break, a sort of natural fire break. The Monongahela House, said to be Pittsburgh's first hotel and first built in 1840. That's a, uh, a photograph and it's got those uh, free power flags on top. Destroyed by the 1845 fire and subsequently rebuilt in 1847. Notice the electric streetcar side by side with the horse-drawn carriages. Uh, I can notice an artist's impression of what well, appears to be a streak. I don't know if it's electric. I can't tell that. There are no electric wires around it or anything. I'm not, again, I'm not that educated. It's a different, I've done so many tangents today. I'm not going to find out about the engineering of streetcars right now, but uh, I can definitely see a steamship next to it as well. So it'd be weird to have horse-drawn carriages, steam and electric in the same image, unless they were sort of experimenting with all these different things and horse-drawn carriages were the thing of the now and electric things were the thing of the future and they were just putting them in and steam was interesting as well for the boats and that's there too and I don't know, it's just someone's drawing. The flames were said to move slowly, giving people time to remove themselves and their belongings and going to places like the Hill District, said to be undeveloped except for the newly built Allegheny Courthouse. Pictures, no commentary. Crossing the Monongahela River at the bridge there, which is now called the Smithfield Street Bridge. When the fire ended the next day, it was said to have destroyed one third of the city, leaving scattered chimneys and walls in the ruins. And it was said, inexplicably, there were occasional buildings left untouched amidst the destruction. It was said. It was said. Now, I don't know who said it. <laughs> I don't know if this is just another Wikipedia read, but inexplicably some buildings were left untouched. Uh, maybe if you're just a random street dweller, you might think, oh God, how did that church survive? Or how did this, or maybe it is explicable because of winds or materials or, I don't know, I wasn't there. I wasn't there, you know, but when you say it's inexplicable, a lot of the time these people say something was inexplicable and we find a really easy and common explanation, so. The Great Fire of Bucharest in what is- oh. That's the end of that then. I don't know what she's trying to point out by that. I don't know what proof or evidence it is of anything. She's poking into these historical fires and finding out that they happened. Now Romania took place in March of 1847 and was said to be the largest conflagration ever in Bucharest, destroying 1,850 buildings and one-third of the city in its richest and most populated part. 1850 buildings. Hmm. There is a weird number synchronicity embedded in this data point. So far... What? Hang on. 50 buildings and one-third of the city chimneys and walls in the ruins. And it was said, inexplicably, there were occasional buildings left untouched amidst the destruction. The Great Fire of Bucharest in what is now Romania took place in March of 1847 and was said to be the largest conflagration ever in Bucharest, destroying 1,850 buildings and one-third of the city in its richest and most populated part. 
1850 buildings. Hmm. There is a weird number synchronicity embedded in this data point. So she's reading the Wikipedia again. Destroyed 1850 buildings. There's a weird synchronicity. What does she mean? A similar number. Now, it's a weird suggestion, isn't there? Some sort of synchronicity in the number. I don't, I don't know what she means. So far, all of these fires, except the 1845 Great Fire of New York City, were said to have destroyed one-third of their respective cities. Yeah, so, except the New York one, so not all of them then, but the two that we're looking at are said to have destroyed a third of their cities. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Because a third, at least, would have been packed together tightly with flammable buildings and you've got this industrial revolution happening it makes sense it's that's a, if it's if the cities are similar the similar destruction and the similar scale it was said to have started near the saint demetrius church burning the mahala or neighborhood of saint demetrius the word mahala is said to be arabic in origin in eastern europe and burned the commercial streets of what is now called the Strada Francesa, the Strada Smardan, the Lipscani, where the CEC Palace, or Savings Bank Palace, is located on the left, compared with the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico. What? What? <laughs> the Strada Francesa. The Strada Smardan. The Lipscani. Where the CEC Palace, or Savings Bank Palace, is located on the left. Why has the Palace in Bucharest, Romania, got anything to do with the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico? I'll let you have a little think about that while I just nip for one second to grab something. I'm finishing off this nonsense and then we're doing animals battery change quick battery change And we are getting to the point now where my patience is wearing thin of it. I can only, uh, I can only maintain, you know, there's, there's only so much random stuff you can throw at my brain from different directions before I start getting agitated. Do you know, I mean, I remember having conversations. I'm out of focus now. I don't like it when I'm out of focus either. Ooh. It's even worse. kind of better isn't it am i better now oh, i don't know the um i remember having photos i'm going to do big face and that's going to annoy me if i'm out of focus though you see so there you go the uh i used to go to the i remember once going to the pub and talking to people about brexit <laughs> God, that used to be hell, didn't it? The old Brexit thing. So, um, talking to people about the Brexit, and uh, I'm not, you know, there's no point in riling up old political uh, angers now, is there? But <laughs> what they used to do is, I used to win them on a point. I used to own them on a point because I was quite. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to blow my trumpet or anything, but.
but I went to a decent school, I went to university, I paid attention to politics, I paid attention to all this stuff. Uh, you know, I could see what Nigel Farage was doing, I understood the mechanisms, I could see the whys. So people would say certain things, and I'd already be there with the information, with the research, with the um, whatever, you know, the arguments counter that, and, and to outline it. I could get the Google out on my phone, I could say, no, that's that's this. And they just didn't like that. No one, no one ever, no one ever said, oh, you've made a really interesting point that I hadn't thought of. Maybe I'll change my political ideas. They didn't do that. So it was useless anyway, really. But what they used to do is go, oh, well, what about this then? What about that then? What about this then? And I'd be like, well, what do you mean, what about that then? Aren't we going to acknowledge that I've just made this point? And they'd already be on to this next point. They'd already be on to, and then there'd be somebody else saying something random, like a, a catchphrase or a slogan, and then they'd go. And you'd be like, what? Well, well, you didn't even start to stay to have the debate. You just said the random catchphrase and slogan. It's like this, isn't it? It's like this. I can't, you know, if you're going to do a thing about fires, I can talk about fires. But in the first hour, we had to talk about everything from chuffing free power to, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've been around Dickens, from Dickens to 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 Darwin and uh, and back again. I, I, it's it's so it, it's so is their thinking this way? Is this their their way of thinking? There's there's no organisation to it. There's no um, logic or uh, order. There's no order, is there? There's no order. It just flits in fancies and fires and it's up and it's down. And it's here. It's there. And now we've got the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico and the, the Palace in Bucharest, Romania. And I'm not educated enough about the cultures and uh, ideas that went into the, build, the building of these places. So I'm not going to be able to make much comment unless lest I educate myself further, which I can do. But I've been doing that for over an hour now, nearly two. So we're just going to, like I said, I'm, I'm no longer able now to, to Google things. And maybe this is how it works. Maybe this is how it works, that if you think about these things long enough, with, you talk about them enough with these people, because I suppose the logical conclusion to what we're doing here is to get these people onto the show and to ask them some questions. Oh, I don't think we should give them the airtime, really. You know, I don't think we should give them the, the airtime. And I don't think they would like the things I would say to them, because I think I would end up being rude to them. Uh, in a way, you know, I'd say things like, don't you think you're ignorant? Do you know why you are ignorant? I'd ask them about their education. So they'd get angry, you know, they'd get angry. They'd start poking at me and I'd say, hang on, this is not about me. I'm not the one making the claims. You know, I'm allowed to be this and that and the other. I'm not the one making the claims. But you, you have to have some, you know, some degree of validity about you if you're going to make the claims. I don't know. It wouldn't go well, would it? It wouldn't go well. I don't know. But uh, you could see the antagonism in my brain. You can see how I'm being antagonized by this it's not lazy thinking. It's almost deliberate manipulation now because it's so constant. It's a constant barrage of like almost random, but they're not random either. They're a collection of ideas, but almost like random. Uh, it's like being shot by arrows and missiles and peas and pellets and all sorts from all different directions. And you're trying to fend off one thing and, and say, look, this is clearly this. And, but you can't even get that out because you, it's too much. It's too much. But what it does do is it highlights their thinking and their, you know, the way they're organizing their arguments, which is terrible. Compared with the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City on the right and the Baratia Church. You know, if someone's going to do that to you, yeah, if someone's going to say, look, here's this, compare it to that and then move on and not actually give you any underpinning context or, or even what they're really suggesting, they're not even stating what they're really suggesting, then they are either an idiot or they're being deceptive and, and deliberately confusing. So you want to look at that, just that, and say, look, this person, it's the first time I've listened to anything that Michelle has said. It's the first time I've listened to anything she said. But that's enough for me to, to that's a big red flag. You know, that's enough for me to spot her, to see her for what she is. In Mexico City. I can't determine exactly whether she's ignorant or deliberately malicious, you know, malignant, but either is dangerous. Either of these ideas, somebody that ignorant or that deliberately malicious, both of those things are, are dangerous, really. And for these two buildings to not be framed the same so that there's that 
That step in the frame. Whoa, that's annoying as well, isn't it, for your OCD? City on the right. And the Baratia Church, said to have burned down in the fire and reconstructed by 1848, and the Big Bell Fort cast in 1855, paid for by Emperor Franz Joseph I of... And I would have you note that that church has got a big metal cross on top, so they'd be getting the free power, won't they? As will that building over there that's got a funny dome and a, a flagpole. Free power. Austria, among other places in the old Bucharest. A re Just got to let the cat in. Oh, I love listening to meowing. Don't I? I love listening to you meowing. That's my new favourite. Song. Come on, I need to chill. I don't. I need to go out with the dogs and chill. This is getting on top of me now. Reconstruction fund was said to have been started after the fire was put out, with contributions from the Prince of Wallachia, banks, churches, monasteries. The tr she's literally using Wikipedia. Like she's literally showing us that she's using Wikipedia now. So I use that against you. You're using it as your uh, what? Treasury. What? Clerks and soldiers, the City Halls Association. You can't believe that, apparently, though, because that's Wikipedia and it's written by the devil, apparently, remember. And outside contributors. A reconstruction commission was formed, and so on and so forth. For an in-depth expose of the modus operandi surrounding great fires, very similar to what I just shared about the Bucharest fire and its aftermath, I... You, she didn't share any modus operandi. She suggested that it was some form of reset, that it was some form of demolition so that they could get rid of the free power. She suggested that, but she didn't really. Now, what she's saying here... Very similar to what I just shared about the book operandi surrounding... For an in-depth expose of the modus operandi surrounding great fires, very similar to what I just shared about the Bucharest fire and its aftermath, she hasn't shared anything about the Bucharest fire, any modus operandi. She's confused about what she's doing or she's manipulating and being deceiving. And uh, her, her, her language, her grasp of language isn't particularly good. Uh, For an in-depth expose of the modus operandi surrounding great fires, very similar to what I just shared about the Bucharest Very similar to what I just shared. Very similar to the information that I just shared to what I just shared. I don't know if I'd say what there. Forest fire and its aftermath. I highly recommend that you look into Baltimore Fats YouTube channel and view his stellar analysis of the chain of events surrounding the great fire of Baltimore of 1904. Right, so this is a problem because you're going to say the reference point here that I'm referencing is somebody else's YouTube channel. So now I've got to go into their YouTube channel and see if they have any validity but you can't reference this and say this is valid. My video here that I'm saying without any uh, backup, without anything to back it up, is valid because someone else has made a YouTube video. That's not how this works. You can't do that. But it's nice that we've got someone else to follow. This is obviously where she's got her ideas from. Someone else on YouTube, isn't it? Someone on YouTube said something weird and she's decided to go with it <laughs> rather than find out that it's just rubbish and it's aftermath he has been producing a series of videos about it and more yet to come great stuff the st louis fire of 1849 was said to have destroyed st louis a significant part of st louis missouri st louis and many of the steamboats using the mississippi and missouri rivers these two rivers converged near st louis St. Louis. Pictured on the right. And I believe they are actually canals. In <laughs> canals. Because as we arrived at the New World, as we arrived at the New World in our, in our boats, we thought, wouldn't it be handy if we had vast canals carved out of the landscape? So we'll just get to that then. We'll just get to that. We'll just carve out some vast canals. Or it might be... It might be that we just built up our stuff around the existing waterways. Might be. I mean, you could possibly get some geography people, some people that know a bit about geography, to look into that, couldn't you? That could be verifiable. If we did dig them out, where would we put all the mud? 
Mud's coming back into it again. Comparison with the Raccoon and Des Moines rivers in Iowa on the top left, and the Blue Nile and White Nile in Khartoum in Sudan on the bottom left. The fire was said to have started on the paddle-wheeled steamboat White Cloud, which was at the foot of Cherry Street on May 17, 1849. Just wanted to point out that uh, that's a photograph again, isn't it? Good evidence. It was at the foot of Cherry Street on May 17, 1849. This same year also coincided with the beginning of the California Gold Rush, which started in 1849. Oh, very close to 1850. So these numbers are coming up again. It's magic numbers. St. Louis was said to be the last major city where travelers could get supplies. St. Louis. Before heading west for the California and Oregon trails. At any rate, the burning white cloud was said to have been set adrift by the fire and ended up burning 22 other different types of ships along the way, which soon leapt to buildings on the shore, burning everything on the waterfront levee for four blocks. Sounds horrific, doesn't it? Oh, oh that was supposed to be a pause, but I accidentally skipped. Four blocks to Main Street and Olive Street. It was said that as a result of these fires, a new building code required new structures to be built of stone or brick. Makes sense, doesn't it? That was happening all over the world. Here you have an 1858 engraving of Main Street in St. Louis with its nice masonry and horse-drawn wagons and dirt-covered street. So she spotted this one's not a photograph. And here's another example of perfect framing of the famous St. Louis arch between buildings from Laclede's Landing. Perfect framing, but this time instead of looking through the arch at the building, we're looking through some buildings at an arch. Perfect. Of course, if you step four steps to the right, you can't see it anymore because it's just about the way you turn your head, isn't it? It's just about perspective. If you turn around, you can't see it anymore. It's perfectly framed between this particular... It's not perfectly framed, though, is it? Because it's more... Careful. I'm, maybe I'm knocking that around by going... Poof. Maybe that's doing the, the microphone. Hang on. It's perfectly framed between this particular... It's not perfectly framed, though, is it? I'm a bit, aren't I? Uh, anyway, look, it's not perfectly framed because uh, it's more framed to the right of the frame there. If you measure the distance between the base of the arches and the buildings, there's more space on the left-hand side. So it's not perfectly framed. You could have framed that better. But framing's just a matter of photography and angles. It's not a matter of, like, they didn't deliberately build that so you stand here. And if they did, why aren't you standing in some special thing? Why is there a bin over there? Why are you standing out by the bins? Why is that the special place? This is the St. Louis City Hall, circa 1900, said to have been built in 1890. I really wish, like, I like the fact that you say it is, but I really wish you would just show us the website you got it from. You know, tell, it's nice that you're telling me these buildings. The other people don't always tell me what the buildings are, but it's nice you're telling me what they are. But I'd like it if you could reference, you know, your source. And that one, why is it not covered in mud? Why is it not sunk in the mud? Is it supposed to, isn't it supposed to be sunk in the mud or something? Circa 1900, said to have been built in 1890. It was built in 1890. And here it is today, missing some things from the original. The first great Toronto fire was said to have occurred in 1849. Also known as the Cathedral Fire, it was the first major fire in the history of Toronto with much of the business core of the city being wiped out, we are told, including the predecessor of St. James Cathedral, home of the oldest congregation in the city. The St. James Cathedral was said to have been rebuilt starting in 1850 and opening to the public in 1853. I have serious doubts about the veracity of that information. She, she doubts that but it would have been recorded in more than one place, wouldn't it? The church would have made their own records of their building, and so would the people who did the building, and so would the uh, municipal uh, authorities, and, you know, she's doubting it. It just, it, you state something, and you say you doubt it. You don't even show us the information. It's just a weird thing to say. And is the suggestion here, the building up of the, oh, because there's more fires that happened around the same sort of time, so, oh, conspiracy. But, of course, there's a logical explanation, which is that things were being built in really 
almost archaic ways you know they weren't the most modern things they were uh, cheap and flammable and then you had all these other more dangerous fires going on because you had furnaces and industrial revolution and cars with engines and you know all this stuff started going on and then things got set on fire more and that's because it was naturally going to happen it was the you, you had the same powder keg all over the world in all these major cities that were industrially <laughs> uh, progressive and then uh, they made a big change you know, that was that made sense doesn't it and it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that all the fires happened then these are just the fires that happened then there were fires all over the place in the previous hundred years leading up to it, there were fires all over the place, and the years before it. In in 1666, London burned like rotten sticks. So from 1600, you've been having these big fires. It's not just that big fires were a more common occurrence in the past before we had regulations and fire engines and uh, you know all that sort of stuff. 50, and opening to the public in 1853. I have serious doubts about the veracity of that information. This is a depiction of the 1831 City Hall and Market Building at King and Front Street, said to have been destroyed and torn down in the 1849 Toronto Fire, and was said to have been rebuilt in 1850 and called St. Lawrence Hall, a meeting hall in a north-south orientation, and the first to be known as the St. Lawrence Market. The railways were said to arrive in Toronto. Look, proof. The world's on a wonk, look. Proof, that building's slipping over on the wonk. Proof. Or it might just be the perspective and angle of the photograph, maybe. Toronto in 1850, and street rail lines were said to have been operating from the Yorkville Town Hall in 1861 to the St. Lawrence Market. The Krakow Fire of 1850 in Poland was said to have started in July of that year and lasted several days, destroying about 10% of Krakow. Again, I'm not referencing these. I'm assuming she's got them all off Wikipedia. So I'm assuming because we kept finding these things. I, I'm not going Googling, but I'm, just, I'm now just taking it on trust that what she's saying is correct. But I'm just assuming she's got it off Wikipedia because she got so much off Wikipedia thus far. It was said that in 1850, Krakow was still reliant on wood as a construction material, and that most of the 1,700 buildings in the city were wooden, and that masonry ones had wooden elements. This is a photo of Krupnicza Street, on which the fire in Krakow was said to have started in the grain mill area. Obviously, it's this is a photograph of modern times, so none of the buildings that are there now would have been there, because they all burned down, didn't they? So. And I can show you the same street corner layout in Kona Creek, Guinea, in Africa on the top left, in Juarez, Mexico on the top right, Kirsten, Ukraine on the bottom left, and Summerside on Prince Edward Island in Canada on the bottom right. There are some buildings around the world that seem sort of similar in ways because they're built on corners and architects have decided to put doors on corners. They're all fairly modern buildings. This is proof of nothing. The accident causing the Krakow fire. This this image is this pixelated. She's obviously just ripped it off off uh, Wikipedia. I can't make anything out. Is attributed to a miller and a smith who were trying to fix some equipment and ended up starting a fire, which spiraled out of control. Subsequently, the fire was said to have grown, affecting the city center. Students from the University of Krakow. Notice this photograph. This is what I was saying before about some of the previous photographs. You know, they say in the past there were no people in the photographs. Where are all the people? This is a photograph of a building, right? And if you want to take a photograph of a building, the building's not going to move, is it? It's going to stay there. So you don't have to have a fast shutter speed. You can leave your shutter open for a long time and allow the light to enter the camera over a longer period of time. It's not like sport photography where you want the people sharp in the moment. You leave the shutter open and it takes a really detailed picture of the building. But what happens to the people? Look, some of them are like ghosts. Some of them you can almost see through. And some of them you can't even nearly see. They're nearly not there at all. Because if they're moving quickly, they won't even appear. Because they won't have enough time in one space to cast their image into the camera. It, The light bounces off them. And the, the people that you can see are the ones that are staying more still are moving more slowly and the people that you can't see are the ones that are moving more quickly 
It could be a layered image. It could be someone's taken multiple images of this building and layered them up. That's another possibility. That's another possibility. But all these different photographic anomalies are causing... You know, all those different explanations are causing these ghostly sort of people, almost non-existent in place. You don't know where the people are and where they're not if you can't see them. And that could play into the reason why there aren't people in the photographs. Also, if you take this photograph at 2 o'clock... Uh, the afternoon you're going to get people in it and if you take this photograph at six o'clock in the morning when the sun comes up there are not going to be so many people and if you take this photograph at busy nine o'clock in the morning they're going to be busy but ten past nine they're all going to be in work and it's going to go quiet for all of a sudden do you know what i'm saying were said to have prevented the fire from causing more than superficial damage to the university's library Buildings said to be damaged or destroyed by this fire were the Krakow Bishop's Palace, You're right, it's... the Wielopolski Palace, You're messing. the Church of St. Francis of You're Assisi right, in Krakow, the Wielopolski Palace, and the Basilica of Holy Trinity in Krakow. The fire was said to have caused economic stagnation in Krakow, the final establishment of firefighting service in 1865. And there you go. The final establishment of a firefighting service. Until then, we were building big cities, we were industrially changing things, having big furnaces and fires and engines going on, and we hadn't even established a, a norm of having a fire service. So after the cities burned down, all in the same sort of periodic historic time period, not a surprise because the, the, uh, you know, the factors that play into these big fires, the industrialization, the urbanization, you know, the, all those factors came to, it was like a, a cry, uh, perfect storm, wasn't it? And we had all these fires and then they said, you know what, we should have fire services. They've got one in, in, that, in that city that burned down. They've started up a fire service. We should have one as well, fire engines. Yeah, we should. It's a bit late now, obviously, because everything's on fire, but you know, it's a good idea, yeah. Restoration of affected buildings finishing in 1912. In my next video, I will be finishing this series by looking at historical fires that took place in the historical record between- Great. Nice one, Tracy. I'm glad we're finished with this video now. We can ease off. We've done our two hours. We've done good work. We have done good work. She's got a, a Patreon. She's got a Patreon. Don't know why it's not actually a link there. Don't know why it's not a link. She's getting 300 and she's getting 400 pound a month. Look. She's getting £400 a month, yeah? She's creating, revealing what's been hidden in front of our eyes. There she is. I can't look at her picture any bigger than that. She's getting £400 a month, right? I've got a patron. I don't push it, you know, I don't push it. I don't push it. I don't like, you know, go on about it. I've got to sort out my membership levels. I only want people to subscribe in £20 integers. We've sold out of the small numbers. You, you can only get, a, maybe that's my problem. I'm only getting 65. It's, it's loads. Actually, I'm so grateful to our patrons. Don't get me wrong here. But I'm getting a fraction of what she's getting. There's something wrong here. There's something wrong. I, inv I invite you to subscribe. You don't have to patron. I'll sort it out. I'll change the layers. I'll change the levels. We'll do it in the future because I'm not so money oriented as other people. So I leave this to stagnate. But I should do more to it to make it more appealing. I get it. I'll look into that. But we've also got this system that tip me a coffee. We've also got this system. Because if you tip me, like, you know, if you've been listening to the busker and you throw him a couple of quid in the hat, you can tip me and you can buy me a coffee here. I get basically 90% of that money. 
Not like on Twitch or YouTube where they take their cut. Oh, but this, I would basically get all that money. So that's really handy for me. I thank everyone who buys me coffees. I think it's really, it's a good system. It works for Limmy. On, you know, other streamers do it. That's my system that I'm mainly, that's the bigger kitty. That's the main hat. But I'm, I'm going to set up, now that I've seen hers, 400, she's getting 400 pound a month. I could live off that. That would make a difference to me in my life. At the moment, I'm struggling on like a quarter of what she gets. My income. I'm struggling. I'm not like here saying I'm struggling, give me money. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just comparing myself to her there. She's doing better out of it. But her videos are all nonsense. So I've done two hours of like nonsense debunk. I think I've done more valuable work. You know, in the big picture of things, I think I've done more valuable work. Maybe it's easier to get idiots to subscribe to your patron because they're, you know, the people that subscribe to her patron are not probably the smartest chuffers, are they? Because they believe all that chuff. So maybe it's easier to convince them to give you money. But you, critical thinkers, you smart people that watch me, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not even trying to convince you. I'm not even trying to blag you. Like, and if I were, you'd see straight through it anyway. So there's no point. I've just got to do my best to create good quality media and hope that people will chip me a little tough, buy me a coffee or hope that we can develop as a media product and get more subscribers, more views and, you know, develop in that way. I've just got to hope for that. Michelle's, she's not hoping, she's out spending the money. Maybe I should be doing nonsense videos about the Great Flood. She's out spending the money. It baffles me. It's, it's bizarre to me that she's got like a, a more successful online presence than me. <laughs> I find it quite funny. I'm not angry about that. I'm not angry about that. I find it quite funny. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what goes on on the internet. There's all sorts of things out there going on on the internet. Don't get me started. So there's an all sorts of lots of things on the internet. But uh, there's just another one. <laughs> so I am Ganji Kid. I'm me. I'm the Grave Kipper. I might have to change the name Ganji Kid. I might have to change that. Because I think, I was going to say this at the start of the broadcast, but I've left it right to the end now. I think that it says Ganji and people think that means like marijuana. But actually Ganji means cool in Korean. And I've had this gamer tag since I was like 15. Or like maybe a bit long later than that. Maybe Skyrim. No, since Zelda, since Zelda. When was the first time I could fit? I mean, when I did Zelda, I probably just called myself Ganji or how many letters could you fit in? Three or four, I can't remember. But uh, when I played Skyrim for the first time, I was Ganji, son of the red eye. It was like my, it, my gamer character had transcended one game and they were in another. So I gave them a similar name, but not the same name. They were like another form of the same character. You know what I'm talking about. Role-playing games always being the same character, giving them a similar name. So that's where Ganji Kid came from. But I do worry that in the longer term, as we develop, it's going to hold us back in some way because people are going to think, oh, does he mean weed kid? And I'm not a kid anymore either, so there's that. But I am the Grave Kipper. I'm also the Grave Kipper. Look, let just put that there, look, Grave Kipper. So I could change it to that one day, you never know. And I'm also Scott, so, you know, get that down your pipe hole. And I think that in the, the coming months, we should, we should, in theory... We should, in theory, we, in theory, you know, if, if there's any justice in the world, there's not, there's not, but, you know, how can my, I'm not popping off like, 65, she need, I need more, I need, I need to beat her, I need to beat her, look, so there we go, we've done a, uh, <laughs> I'm only joking, it's not, I'm not in direct competition with her, but, you know, we've done our bit of, uh, we've done our bit of, interesting valuable media for the day more valuable than that <laughs> and now i'm going to go out and do something else valuable with my time which is to walk the doggy and uh, i might be back on later this evening on twitch i said that yesterday but i didn't bother but i might be tonight you never know you never know who knows i'm going to see how it goes we're going to do more of this daily regular youtube daytime uk daytime a stream about stuff and chuff and then on twitch i might put the gaming more on twitch like you're supposed to you never know mental health monday on monday of course back on stream tomorrow 
later, whatever. You be good, my little Pukosh, you be good. And if you can't be good, then uh, I'm going to set fire to uh, all of your stuff and um, in doing so, prevent you from getting free energy. We didn't really go deep on the free energy, did we? We didn't go deep on the free energy today. It just seems obvious, doesn't it, that that's nonsense.